today now when we have seen the D2C industry growing, what more problems need to be solved and therefore what D2C brands do you see uh, coming up in times to come? The first starting point is what is that consumer inside? What is that white space right. which is not getting met with the existing offerings? D2C is you know almost you know stereotyped into you know, uh, your own website and trying right. to you know sell through that uh, okay. channel. We think it's a channel. Right. Now what started out was really trying to figure out options which digital will enable through access, through conversations, through you know, digital media. Now COVID happened and accelerated the adoption of digital far significantly. Now what we are finding is the biggest driver of this whole opportunity is this you know, concept of omnichannel. It is not about D2C, it is not about e-commerce, it is not about quick commerce, it is about how do you integrate everything into one common you know, paradigm. So maybe take an example, we have a company called the Sleep Company. Right. Sleep Company is a mattress company which is getting into comfort tech. But they realize very soon that it's an expensive product and people want touch and feel. So they have to start opening up stores. But the store business is so beautifully integrated with the online. I can tell you the experience of walking into a sleep company store and walking into a store of any other mattress brand is completely different. There is no shelves of products. There is no stacked up products which you guys are throwing up and down. Right. There are three beds. You can lie down. You can experience it. You want to order, they'll open up an iPad. The same Shopify system which powers their online is powering this. The same logistic, the same warehouse. Now that is the innovation. That right. is the omni-channel play. Correct. So if you start now visualizing, saying, how do I make a brand, you know, relevant to consumer? Absolutely. And I totally agree with you that, you know, the opportunity perhaps in one way has just started. Uh, but sir, at the same time, we're also seeing that there is a lot of Me Too now happening in the market. As in somebody who's uh, building this industry brick by brick, how do you sort of say that, you know, how would a sleep company be differentiated from a wake fit or let's say some other mattress brands? So similarly, if somebody is in the beauty industry, how do they differentiate themselves? Because, you know, you don't want a full shelf and nobody buying. First of all, Me Too doesn't work. So therefore, where do we, how do we bring the disruption? I think what India has not seen enough of, and I believe there is huge opportunity, is true R&D based innovation. The first fundamental thing is that there is an opportunity to innovate on product. Right. I think the second fundamental thing is there is an opportunity to uh, innovate on the business models. And there are two ways to do that. One is on the supply chain. You have to almost start from a zero base of saying, who's this consumer? What are they looking for? What is the pack size? You know, I'll give you an example of 30 years ago when I started uh, my management training days in Hindustan Lever. Right. And this was the first time that anybody in the country had launched a sachet, a shampoo sachet. Right. You know, this was in 1987. Uh, sorry, I'm disclosing my age, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> we were selling sachets in the market with the premise that this is not going to replace my shampoo bottle. We said there is this girl in the small towns of Barabanki and the small towns of you know, UP where I was training, who is going to use Lifebuoy to wash her hair every day. But on a Sunday she wants to use a sachet. Now that is an insight. Right. Therefore the price, the SKU, the unit size, all of that was designed for that. I am saying if you can think through that model, that is the second uh, I, I would say opportunity. The third one is the business model of how you engage consumers. Again, one interesting example, we have a company called Traya. Traya is a hair loss solutions company. It's a problem. They started with men and therefore the desire to manage that or have an answer to that is very high. So there's a huge market. That's never a question. Now what the company decided is that this is not something which can be just solved through topical application. Because topical application you apply and then you stop applying, it kind of goes back to uh, the reversal. So they figured out through some R&D, through some discovery and through some development that there are three elements which need to be sorted for. The first element is your gut. The cause of hair loss starts with the gut. Then the element is your diet and you know what you're eating, not just for the gut, but also you know some 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 things that you eat can also you know in, increase the uh, you know, uh, incidence of hair loss. And then of course the topical part of it. 
so they created a program and they said that we are going to offer this as a regime so now their business model is not selling products or not selling creams their business model is selling a regime so there is engagement there is nudges there are coaches you know so the whole business model has got transformed from not selling product but some kind of a solution my you know submission to the group here and you know a much larger audience is think innovation think you know what is that insight which will change the way you are communicating with the consumer there is no second best unfortunately you know the, the chasm between the first and second is so high that it doesn't even work right so you know bootstrapping has always been a great way to do business in our country so you know what is your advice to young brands who who are actually looking to build a business but can't find funding and sometimes therefore don't want to carry on with the business so i think first of all i would not 100% agree with the fact that there is less funding i think there is more funding today the funnel at the top of the uh, you know startup ecosystem is so robust with angels family offices right. angel networks if you don't have something that convinces me that it is exciting why would i invest the bottom line is that funding is not the issue right. i think it is getting the investor to understand why i will be successful and second is that funding is also a double edged sword you raise as much money as you need to get to that proof point i don't know if any of you know this but in 2016 the total money that uh, varun raised for mama earth was 70 lakhs with 70 lakh rupees he was able to take a business to a revenue run rate of about 30 lakhs a month and that is when we put the money from uh, fireside you can build a very nice you know almost like a personalized business and build it slowly over time with a certain limited amount of funding and i think that is to me the biggest uh, you know success mind yeah. uh, change uh, which yeah. needs to happen yeah. so funding is there and sir do you feel that there are opportunities for merger and acquisitions for example if somebody is you know doing a product it could be bought by let's say a larger be- beauty company it's, or it's 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 growing growing like a weed every large consumer company is looking for acquisitions right. every i can tell you that categorically because we talk to them because there is a fundamental issue for large corporates to, to innovate this kind of innovation correct yeah they are not the 0 to 1 or even the 1 to 10 guys mm. but at 100 crores 150 crores they are extremely acquisitive because they know that now the muscle that they have distribution quality you know supply chain manufacturing they can accelerate that business from 100 to 500 to 1000 much better than sometimes even the entrepreneurs so i think the the desire to acquire is very high yeah. i think how you integrate how you then work with the company i mean those are still challenges which are not easy to solve for so i wouldn't say it's a you know right. uh, whatever bed of roses that it's happening no no always difficult but <laughs> achievable no no the opportunity is there so what what is exciting ritu for us is that we are seeing exciting new ideas we are seeing very high quality entrepreneurs and we are seeing the ecosystem mature whether it's infrastructure whether it is you know even things like quick commerce o and dc they are all contributing to what is possible and where it is going so i am uh, absolutely heart on my sleeves big believer that every one of you in this room who has come here all the way i'm assuming you have some interest in digital brands or even brands you are in a good space so at what point do you think a company should really think an ipo i think what we are finding is that if you have a fundamentally strong business model which is profitable which is high growth which is enough of a niche that you can continue to grow without you know getting sw- uh, whatever swatted aside by the big boys i would say at a thumb rule a 100 million dollar brand and uh, a double digit ebitda would be a good candidate for ipo it's a journey both for the company and for the investors but today we too believe that a 100 million dollar kind of a revenue uh, with a, at least a double digit kind of a ebitda so let's say about 70 80 crore 100 crore type of you know bottom line uh, ebitda could be a very good ipo uh, candidate and sir would you also suggest for them to go the sme ipo route is that a good idea for a d2c brand 
I think the way I have understood the SME IPO is that it is more of fundraising alternate to build your business. It is not a liquidity uh, opportunity yeah. where you know as investors you can uh, exit because uh, the sizes are small and the floats are very low. So we have been told continuously by the experts, by the you know people who understand the stock markets that these brands do have potential to list on some of these exchanges. The challenge is that if you are able to raise private money and if you are able to take it to the level where they can list on the you know the main bourses, right. that is always better because then you know it's just that the the fundamentals you know match both in terms of liquidity, in terms of coverage, you know lots of those yeah, things yeah. start becoming. Thank you so much, sir. This is this has really been a wonderful conversation. So please, a huge round of applause to.